<clears throat> so today we're going to talk about rivers just a little bit and what I'd like to, to show you I guess is a, a mature stream. I'm going to take the James River because it's a local river in the Springfield Greene County area. I'll do a cross section so if we have a cross section that shows the hills on the sides and then the valley floor very commonly the river has this sort of profile and there'll be a bluff maybe on the other side over here. Um, the James would flow right through here and uh, very often you would have uh, gravel bars and usually the gravel bar would be on the inside of this and over here you may have a kind of a steep bank, a cut bank if you will and that is uh, pretty much a profile and so this area from here right there all the way over to here constitutes, constitutes the floodplain. So if that is the floodplain of the James River let's say here's the James River itself that's the water and all uh, that's there and the you may have a little ridge right at the side right there and right, a ridge right over here as well and um, so this being the channel that's the river channel right there it's going to have various depths across there and so very commonly there will be one area that's a little bit deeper than the rest and so that area right there that is the deepest in a river channel is called the Thalweg T-H-A-L-W-E-G the deepest water in a channel and so that's the Thalweg right here. Um, as the water flows through this, let's say it's flowing towards us here, one of the ways that we can determine what the, the highest velocity, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a simple rule that we call it the six-tenths rule and that suggests, I'm going to, I'm going to actually make a, a larger version of this right here. And so here's our Thalweg right here, deepest part of the river. At six tenths water depth, right about there. So if we divide it into ten parts, you go six parts down and four parts would be at the very bottom down here. That is the average velocity of that stream right there. And the reason for that is is because there's there's going to be some friction up here at the surface with the air and there's obviously going to be some friction down here on the river channel as well. And so the average velocity is right here. Now as it turns out the highest velocity is right about in here. There's a sweet spot where the, the there's a slug of water that is unencumbered by the friction at the top or the friction friction at the bottom and so the highest velocity is going to be right in here in kind of a sweet spot and then the average velocity is going to so that's the high velocity zone right there and everything else of course is going to be lower velocity over here you get a lot more friction over here you got friction along the cut bank and so forth so the two parts of this thing okay over here we're going to call that the point bar this is going to become obvious when we start talking about we're going to talk about um, meandering here in a second but this is going to be the cut bank over here steeper bank on this side so point bar cut bank on that side of this of the channel average velocity is the six tenths rule okay that's that one right there and then the high velocity zone is this slug of water that's coming down just below the surface right in here and so that is the high velocity zone so that's what a that's what a floodplain kind of looks like, a simple floodplain. And okay, so these humps on the side here, sometimes the river will flood and the water spills out and co covers the entire surface of that flood valley. This happens on the James on a much more regular basis than what it used to. I think there were 56 feet above normal flood stage. So normal flood stage would be right here right at the tops of the banks where the, where the river would begin to overflow. Um, what you get on the sides of this, in fact, are, are piles of sediment, often sand with the James. And so these are sandy banks that are on either side right in here. 
A lot like when we talked about mass wasting and we talked about debris flows, you can get natural levees there. Well, these things are called natural levees also. So it's a recurring sort of theme in geology that you get natural levees on the side, natural levee on either side of this river channel here. And so natural levees are where if you get out of the get above the flood stage and the river begins to overflow its banks and everything, that's the first place where it begins to deposit some of that dirty water, some of that sediment that's being carried in the water. And so sand and silt and uh, the, the coarse of grain uh, particles are going to fall out right here. And out here you get finer and finer grains. And so in the, in the floodplain itself, they tend to be very, very, well, if you're into agriculture, they tend to be very, very, productive for crops. And so the very finest sediment would be deposited out here. When the flood waters recede, it leaves a nice uh, bed of nutrients, in fact, so the new soil and so forth is carried down the stream. So these natural levees here uh, make it possible to kind of keep the river channel from overflowing as much as it normally would. But when it finally overtops those natural levees, uh, they, they can break, they can break, and then they can actually form more sandy sort of uh, complexes out to the side here. They call those things uh, splays just outside of this. So there's a lot of terminology with this. And, but it really is, is one of the more interesting things because you can experience rivers, you know? You, can, you go for a, a kayak or a canoeing trip and things like that. You're going to understand a lot better. Well, in the Ozarks, is in fact, much of our, many of our streams are, are lined with gravel. And that gravel comes out of the bedrock around here. It's chert gravel for the most part. And so it comes out of the dolomite and it comes out of the limestones. And so that is what a floodplain kind of looks like right here, at least in a cross-sectional view. Okay, so hillside over here, the slope next to it here. And a slope over here, maybe a little bit more gentle, perhaps. Yeah, maybe not. Who knows? Um, so natural levees on either side of the channel. The floodplain itself stretches from where it changes slope from one side to the other. Okay, that is a cross section of what it looks like in a floodplain, and a cross section of that actual channel right here with a foul wag, the six tenths rule, the average velocity and what a cut bank and a, and a point bar are here. How do those point bars and cut banks actually form? That's the next little bit that we're going to talk about. So how do we get meander bins to begin with? Now remember, if you have a floodplain, you're actually dealing with a river that is mature. Okay, so it's that middle stage. It's not the the headward region where you get V-shaped valleys and lots of uh, high gradient and so forth. The gradient tends to drop off a little bit when you get into more mature streams. Um, we don't have a lot of turbulence in the water, a little less turbulence anyway. So let's say we have stream systems. Here's some of our head headward streams up here, youthful streams, and they may come together like this. And these, these sometimes form patterns and we're going to talk more about the patterns in this lecture, in a later lecture, uh, with an audio lecture. But, uh, but here I just want to illustrate to you what it looks like to have a trunk stream, which would be this one right here, and a whole bunch of tributaries coming into it. Now this is the hills and hollows if you're in the Ozarks. And uh, little valleys like this may be full of intermittent streams, right? So here's our little intermittent symbol there as you get uh, farther and farther away from the trunk stream. Now the trunk stream itself may be perennial because it's collecting water from all of these other streams in here. So here's our intermittent streams with the symbol and so forth. So I won't go around and do them all. But here's our trunk stream right here. So finally this thing gets to a point where it begins to, I'm going to put a little curve in it just to take advantage of the board here. The, um, you finally get down here and the hills begin to be farther back on the sides of this stream. So the hills may widen out a little bit. 
and maybe there's another stream here, another stream over here, and so forth. Um, and so eventually, this stream begins to have lower gradient, but higher discharge, right? So remember, discharge is the volume of water that flows past a given point at a given period of time. So all of that mass of water has an erosive sort of impact. Now, erosion is the dominant case up in here for the headwater region anyway. That's because of the turbulence, the high gradient, the water flowing through there. You get uh, slumping and you get uh, mass wasting events that will add to the surface roughness of the stream in that sort of area. When you finally get down here where the gradient is less, but the, the discharge may be a little bit more, the stream begins to meander, we call it, and that's where it tends to go from side to side. And so in this case, you may still have some streams coming into the side like this, intermittent or whatever, and but the stream itself becomes entrenched in its own floodplain. So here we develop the floodplain by the time we get down into here. I'm going to zoom in on that sort of area. Okay, so if we I'm going to draw the actual channel itself here now. And so here are some of these meander bends, as we call them. Here's the other side of the channel here. Like so. And let's say the water is now flowing this way in this thing. So we're looking, we're looking down on this whole thing here as though it were a map, and we're looking down on this as well. So here would be the point bar. I'm just going to put PB here for the time being, but that's a point bar, as is that, and that, and that, and that, and that. Those are all point bars. So these PBs, point bar. The other side, of course, you have more erosion going on there. And those are called the cut banks. So here's a cut bank over here. Here's a cut bank over here. Here's a cut bank over here. Cut bank over here. Cut bank over here. And here. So, yeah, cut bank. Yeah, I'm not going to add all these things in here, but you get the idea. Point bars are opposite of the cut banks. So. I used the analogy in the audio lecture that these things are a lot like NASCAR drivers. And so if you can imagine a NASCAR driver coming down this, making that turn, he's going to go up against the embankment there. He's going to go up against the wall, right? And so the water comes down this way, and then it comes to the outside there, and it comes to the outside here. What it does, it means that the cut banks are the areas where you're going to get the most erosion, where the the NASCAR is speeding around the corner here, or the water is piling up around the corner here, and right here as well. And so those are places of erosion. It gives you an idea of what's going to go on in the point bar then. So point bars tend to be places where there's deposition going on. And in fact, in mature streams like this, these are places where the erosion tends to balance out with the the deposition. So the point bars are places where it's a little bit more slack water. That's, you know, you get your gravel bars and so forth on the inside of the stream. On the outside, that's where the cut bank is. And that's where, well, if we were to draw the cross-sectional profile, let's say, let's say right here at this point bar to that cut bank right here. Here's our profile right here. Cut bank on this side. In fact, it may be eroded there and here's your natural levee up above that and natural levee back that way. This is where the river is doing that helical flow that we talked about in the audio lecture. So the helical flow is going to take and it's going to spiral as it comes down this stream. If you, if you can imagine like a spiral bound notebook and that spring that's in there and if you stretched it out that's the sort of like, you know, flow that this thing would have. And so this thing is flowing what we call helical flow. But it's one of these things, it just spirals as it goes down. And so it's doing this sort of loop and it'll reverse and, and, and uh, 
But in other words, you get a lot of undertow in these places that have the cut banks. So the cut banks get a lot more erosion because of that motion, even though well, it's closer to the higher velocity zone. See, so this is going to be low velocity over here, and sediments are going to tend to pile up in the point bar sorts of settings. And so that's where deposition is most dominant, erosion over here on the cut bank. So what happens through time, in fact, let me do a little erosion here myself. Take that off and take this off. This bank is going to slough off. And in fact, your cut bank is going to migrate in that direction. And the point bar, because it's being deposited there, is going to migrate out the same direction. So in fact, through time, the cut bank will move and the point bar will move. And you get this sort of setting where it goes a little bit more and it goes a little bit more. Now, let me, uh, since we're on a roll here, I'm going to go ahead and erase all this. And I'm going to draw it as though the channel that you see right here, we're going to pick it up again right up here. I'm just going to make one single line to indicate cut bank, cut bank, cut bank, cut bank, cut bank. And our point bars are out here on the tips of these points like this, right? Cut bank. And eventually you're going to get to a point as the, as the river begins to meander, that meandering process actually changes where the channel itself flows. Let's go through another iteration here. We can go out a little farther. Remember, we're speeding around the outside there. You can see what's going to happen here. Mesmerizing, isn't it? Eventually, there's going to come to a point where that's going to break through right there. So if we've got point bars and cut banks right here, all of a sudden it begins to, it finds a low spot, cuts, cuts completely through on the outside of the cut bank there, and allows the water to flow in, and it takes a shortcut. And that shortcut, it may have happened there, it could have happened in here, right? Or it could have happened there, or there, any one of those, but those are called cutoffs. And so cutoffs are where the river changes its course. And what it does, it leaves behind this meander bend out here. Well, if low velocity allows for deposition, then too, if you cut off all the flow in there, that's going to silt in eventually. And so these become silted in. And sometimes you'll actually leave a lake behind in here, slack water. And these things, you know, down in the south, they call these things sloughs. But we also can call them oxbow lakes. And so oxbow lakes are these sort of slack water regions where there's been a cutoff, and that cutoff has caused the flow of water to, you know, go by this area. The, the low velocity zone fills in with sediment in there, and then these oxbow lakes form out in here. These are real common in Mississippi, Arkansas. I think Missouri even has a few of these uh, sort of features. Chico Lake, I think, is one of them in Arkansas. There's a handful of them. Uh, even in uh, Kentucky, there are some of these as well. Uh, and maybe even in Tennessee, if, as I recall. Um, in Mississippi, obviously. In Louisiana, loaded with these sorts of oxbow lakes and tons of cutoffs. Um, you may recall that um, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, the famous author. Um, he was a riverboat captain and he lived in, he grew up in Hannibal and he became a riverboat captain and he learned how to navigate the rivers and he talks about that in a book that he wrote called Life on the Mississippi. And he talks about how if you have enough cutoffs and everything, eventually you're going to shorten the distance between St. Louis and New Orleans at some, or Memphis and New Orleans at some point. Um, which is not really the case, obviously, but he's making a, a jest out of it. But these cut banks and point bars can lead to cutoffs eventually, and the cutoffs will leave behind these sort of oxbow lakes like that. 
This whole process is called meandering, of course. And if you want to think about meandering as an expression of energy, it's the energy of the water as it flows. Meandering is the expenditure of that energy. So if the water has energy, it can erode, it can deposit. High energy it erodes, low energy it deposits. And you leave behind um, a set of landscape features that are reflective of that process of meandering. So meandering, a major process in surface water. Now I have one more uh, topic to cover on this uh, for video and we're going to talk a little bit about flooding again. So flooding. Um, imagine we have the Mississippi River now and here's its floodplain. Massive sort of area, right? Miles across, even the channel itself. It's 50-some feet deep, right? Here's the Mississippi River. Here's uh, Illinois. Here's Missouri over here. And there are the, the river bluffs that mark the edge of that, that river valley here. What they do very commonly, even though you may have some uh, natural levees that originally were there, because of the continual flooding and because of the, the agricultural investment that people make in these floodplains, these are massively productive lands, enormously productive lands. And people live in places like this. So Cairo, Illinois, is a little town that developed with the river boats and so forth that would go down the stream. And so you'd have a river boat and, you know, floating down the stream all the way down to New Orleans, up to St. Louis, and maybe even farther north. And so towns develop in places like this. And of course, one of the features, one of the things about living in a floodplain is it floods there all the time. So if that's Cairo, uh, in southern Illinois, where the Ohio and the Mississippi come together, if that's Cairo, here's the Mississippi River, let's say here, the flood's going to get out of its banks substantially from time to time. And so here's the flood. We're going to get rid of the, the boat here. They're not going to be out during the flood if they can help it. But the town's now underwater, as is all of this farmland over here. How are we going to take care of that? Well, one of the ways that the Army Corps of Engineers takes care of this is by building not natural levees, but artificial levees. And so they'll build a levee in order to contain the river and keep the floods at bay. So it's like building a dam along the banks of the river here. And so here's our stream now, the Mississippi River. And there's a, a levee on both sides here. And so over here, there's farms and so forth that would be protected. And over here, we have the city of Cairo. So through time, when you've confined that flow, and they already dredge part of it, but it's it's a good 50, 50 some feet deep when you're down around you know, places like Hickman, uh, Tennessee, Hickman, Kentucky, or if you're in uh, uh, what's the name? New Madrid in, in Missouri, in places like that, 50 some feet, and it's not far from that in Cairo as well. So when you contain that water level within these levees like this, it doesn't reach its normal heights. And so what happens is it confines the floodwaters better until it can't. And that's when you have bank full flow from levee to levee like this, and the water's just about to overtop. Well, we've had a lot of rain this year, and I'm sure there must be some flooding somewhere in Illinois and parts of Missouri. Um, we've had, uh, the James has gotten out of its banks a couple of times here recently, but not, not very uh, dramatically. Here, if you're going to overtop these levees now, it's going to flood into the town and that becomes an issue yet again. And so why are you better off now with these levees when it's going to flood one side or the other over here? and it's going to wipe out that town, essentially. They keep rebuilding anyway. So in Cairo, in the case of Cairo, and this happened just a few years ago here, they saw it was going to flood the city. So instead of allowing that to happen, they blew this 
levee over here destroyed the levee and allowed the the farmland to become inundated over here to save the city of Cairo over here. So this was high and dry. The farmland became became flooded. It's an issue kind of, you know, for a couple of reasons. One of them is if you overtop a levee, all that water sits around not for just a few days then, it sits around for months. And so all of this land in here became useless for agriculture for at least one or, you know, one season anyway. Um, so when they did that, there was a lot of controversy. Of course, Missouri versus Illinois, that was, you know, who's going to pay for this? And the Army Corps of Engineers always, they pretty much always take the blame for that. And so, so how do we, okay, how do we compensate this farmer over here? Well, I'm sure he had crop insurance, but a lot of these people live where, you know, in the middle of an island, let's say, out in the middle of a new lake on that side. Uh, they just don't have any place to go. So here we have the levees reconstructed. What are you going to do next year? Well, we are not really good at predicting what's going to happen beyond just you know, 10 days in a forecast. 19, I remember 1993. That was one of the really big years for floods. In 1993, the Mississippi flooded, the Missouri flooded, and several other streams flooded. Um, all across the mid-continent region um, in the U.S. And so it became an issue. Um, in this case, the Army Corps of Engineers usually takes responsibility for this. You can declare uh, through FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, you can declare a national, you know, an emergency in certain counties and so forth, and they can get uh, reduced loan rates and you get maybe some, even some federal money in the form of grants and so forth. They would also, of course, have crop insurance uh, that would be able to cover some of the, uh, the issues with the damage and so forth. But it is a real issue, you know, because every time you try to constrain a river, just like trying to constrain a, a coastal region with, with um, they call them groins or seawalls and things like that, it winds up destroying the natural habitat in many ways even though it may protect for a short period of time, it can't protect uh, communities forever. And so that's always been an issue. And when, particularly when a state line runs right down the middle of a river, which, di uh, you know, which state is going to get the benefit, right? So it all depends on the levee system and where they have engineered and put in the levees. Now, I have to tell you, it is never a good idea to build in a floodplain. And even if you're a farmer over on this side, you want to live over in here. You don't want to live down here in the floodplains. People did in the old days because that's all they had. They had smaller plots of land back then. The average family farmer would just have to pack up and leave. Um, anyway, this is an issue. So, but that's, that's a main issue. I guess you would say flooding is one of the main issues when it comes to mature rivers. And it's a very important issue for geologists, for hydrologists who study these sort of flood conditions and so forth. So uh, I'm going to point you in a direction in the audio portion of the lecture to follow this about how the USGS tries to keep their fingers on the pulse of America's river system. If we have blood vessels as, as human beings, the rivers are the blood vessels of our nation, essentially. Um, so anyway, this flooding pretty important when it comes to uh, governmental issues, and they can cost a lot of money through time uh, as well. So that's it for now, and I will carry on with the, uh, the rest of this, this lecture <clears throat> in audio format uh, to company kind of from where we left off. So anyway, I'll talk to you in a bit.